Hey guys, uh, it's Mick here from Dark Star Crystal Mines. I'd like to speak today about our Van Dyke fissures that we have on the Dark Star claim. We've been very fortunate in what we have discovered in this particular area. It's basically gently rolling hills, maple being the main kind of tree that's growing over the, the rock. Uh, the soils are very thin and beneath those soils, if you're standing in the forest and you're looking, you can see that there are these sort of slight indentations in the ground. And if you clear the leaves away, you will discover that they are calcium vein dyke fissures. And this is quite a unique thing. They differ from pegmatites and what is known as scarns. So if we're talking about a pegmatite, uh, a granitic pegmatite in particular, which is basically a lot of what you're getting in this area, you would understand that a pegmatite is an intrusive igneous rock. It's generally composed of quartz and feldspar and mica. Uh, it's formed beneath the ground and it's cooled very slowly. So therefore, as a result, the crystals will be very large. We're talking uh, large feldspar crystals, large quartz crystals, and of course, some of the more unusual kind of crystals, lithium, lithium leading to uh, uh, spodumene, beryllium's and tourmalines of different kinds. If you have the, you know, the lithium there, uh, if you're lucky, you'll also end up with albite tourmalines. Now then we talk about the vein dike, which is what we have. How does that differ from the pegmatite? Well, first of all, the vein dike, whereas the pegmatite is an intrusive igneous rock, the vein dike is a fracture that is filled with minerals from hydrothermal activity. The minerals could well be much the same, generally though silicate minerals, and whereby the pegmatite has been slow cooling magma, what we have here is fluid deposition um, or possibly an intrusion. There's also what is known as the scarn. One of the famous scarns in our area was the, um, was the York River scarn, an amazing spot. I understand that uh, many of the silicate crystals were found there in gem quality. Uh, zircons, garnets, all kinds of things. Well, the scarn is a carbonate rock that has been altered by contact metamorphism or by igneous intrusion. So again, that's different uh, from what we have our vein dikes, which has had the hydrothermal activity bringing materials up from down deep, whereas the scarn has had this contact metamorphism. So those are your three basic kinds of uh, uh, geological forms that have made Bancroft an extremely uh, well-known area to mineral enthusiasts. The Van Dyke fissures is what we have on our Dark Star claim. So there are many Van Dyke fissures in the area where we are. There is, of course, the famous Old Bear Lake diggings. And of course, all of these Van Dykes have been filled with um, calcite. And the minerals seem somewhat common to most of them, but not entirely so, because each particular vein dike is in itself a unique uh, geological formation. So because you find one mineral in that particular vein dike and you find another vein dike 30 feet from it, doesn't mean it'll necessarily have the same minerals. The formative conditions are frequently very different, even though they are located sometimes in close proximity to each other. So think about the silver crater mine. It has a vein dike type of geology, and within those you're finding the radioactive betaphyte crystals, world famous in that area. Uh, I'll also say from personal experience, some very large amphiboles uh, possibly suggesting a lower, uh, a lower temperature as these particular minerals solidified. There'll be other, you know, vein dikes uh, that have radioactive. So, for example, uh, the Rich Richardson, Richardson Fission Mine and the Dyer Currents, uh, they also have radioactives, uh, and they're typified by the fact that there's a sort of purple, veiny type of fluorite. I believe it's what they call fetid fluorite. It has a, a nasty smell to it. And then, of course, uh, quite unique would be the Quirk Lake Occurrence. Uh, basically passing underneath um, the road in the vicinity of Quirk Lake. And it has quartz crystals because a lot of times the vein dikes are bringing up silicate minerals. Quartz not being out of the possibilities, but more commonly in this area, amphiboles, pyroxenes, those type of things. 
but quirk like having the quartz crystals that are covered by a thin skin of hematite. And of course Davis Hill near the Princess Sodalite mine, um, a quarry that's tapping into a, a vein dike uh, occurrence that occurs over quite some distance and within it you're going to find the corundum crystals and uh, the, the nepheline crystals. And then of course there's the popular smart mine out near uh, Lake Clear uh, and within that there's plenty of zircon that's found and of course uh, the apatite, pyroxene and amphibol and mica again. It's kind of funny, I can hear it from the background, I can hear these rock hounds cheering. They've obviously found something really cool. So I'm going to head over in there in a minute and just uh, see what they found. Oh. What's what's the star of specimens here? Specimens. Oh, look at this. Look at this. Uh, what we have at the Dark Star Crystal Mines. I would say it's very close to Bear Lake and as a result the minerals that are found are also quite similar. What we're talking about at both Bear Lake and on the Dark Star claim, we're talking about uh, amphibol nieces intruded a coarsely crystalline pink calcite. You're going to find a great, great, a great deal of uh, euhedral red and green apatites of different sizes depending on the, uh, I believe, probably the cooling temperatures, the bigger crystals forming where, where the appetite solidified would have been much lower. And little tiny crystals, as would be found, say, on in the titanite hull, little tiny crystals intergrown with pyroxenite, that indicates a much higher cooling temperature uh, of the minerals in that fissure. But overall, that's kind of standard for our calcium vein dike fissures. How did our, how did our fissures form? Well, they're a very ancient, ancient uh, product of the geology, which in, when we talk about geological time, we're talking things like in the hundreds of millions of years, in the billions of years. So way, way long ago, um, there was a, a range of ancient mountains growing down the east side of North America. It's what was called the Grenville Range, created by what is known as the Grenville orogeny. Anyway, this, this particular range of mountains grew as a result of the collision and forming of the supercontinent of Rodinia. So these mountains rose up, and as geography would have it, they then eroded. And the earth, then having been depressed by the mountains, the roots were now exposed. And the roots of these mountains, um, they cracked as they rose up. The earth actually cracked. And oddly, when you look at our claim, it's obviously very localized what is occurring here, but it's pretty well all of our fissures are at a 272 degree orientation. Now that's really strange. Um, they've occurred in Nice, which is a heavily masticated rock, um, in this particular case coming from granites, a granite Nice. And so our fissures are actually in this rock and what happened was from way down deep uh, in the region of a uh, hundred million years ago uh, superheated fluids hydrothermal fluids rose up within those fissures and those hydrothermal fluids brought with them calcite and within that calcite you also had um, the appetite which formed within the calcite i don't believe the appetite was coming from uh, the Nice country rock in which these fissures had occurred. Uh, reason being, we have phosphates, we have uh, fluorines, things like that. That's what's required to build the amphibol and allow it to crystallize into what it is, a fluoroapatite crystal, I should say. So these, this extremely heated material, and some of it could well have been melted, I don't know, it originated from uh, the Glamorgan Formation. So far down underneath the mountains, you have layers of limestone and dolostone that had been compressed. And then with the resulting heat, they had um, the silicates and the carbon, carbons, uh, carbonates were basically leached out of that rock. And that's what came up in our fissures. So this pink calcite that you see was actually at one time composing being part of some uh, of, of limestone and of course how did the limestone form well from tiny sea creatures uh, the bones of billions and billions of these little tiny creatures in the ocean formed the actual limestone and then of course 
having the calcite saturated out of the limestone or or sucked out of the limestone by this superheated fluid, it then came up as pink calcite to the surface. Um, as that pink calcite contacted the country rocks, the 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 uh, the gneiss that had formed, part of that country rock melted, and the components of that country rock contributed to the crystals that formed all along the margins of the fissures that we have. Things like, as I say, depending on the heat and the constituent materials. So you had things like, for example, titanite, which would have been possibly in the, the country rock to begin with, but with the heat from the melted, from the molten calcite or from the superheated fluids, this calcite or this titanite came out uh, of the country rock and reformed within the fissures. Again, most of these type of crystals are forming along the edge of the fissure. And then, oddly, as our fissures generally s seem to slope uh, on a, a very slight angle, uh, leaning in a northerly direction, a lot of the crystals drop down onto those leaning rocks, leaning walls of the fissure, and stayed there, stuck to the walls, as you'll often see. For example, the, the, the big dig. The, the northern wall is absolutely covered in crystals. The southern wall, a lot less so. And of course these fissures that we have have been uh, decomposed by slightly acidic carbonic acid from the rain and passing through vegetation. Uh, the rainwater becomes more acidic from the, on the forest floor. It dissolves the calcite and the minerals drop out. And where do the minerals go? Well either they end up being trapped on the, on the, on the sloping wall or they continue down the sloping wall, down to the deepest parts of the fissures uh, that we can access, basically lying on top of the solid calcite that is yet to dissolve. Now, one of the things about these calcite fissures is often when you get to what you think is the very bottom of the fissure, you'll find a hole just a little further along that allows access to even deeper into the fissure and what you thought was the bottom is really just a, a shelf that juts out and fools those, those of us who are less um, insistent in our digging. Now we know that the um, fissures all filled at differing times and we know that because the temperature environments within those fissures were different and the mineral constituents um, the basic elements were different as well. Some of the fissures will have, for example, a higher sodium content. Other of the fissures might have a higher fluorine content. 